So a lot of women are told that if they have a family history of breast cancer, hormone replacement therapy is automatically off the table. I know this is a scary thought, it's a scary conversation, but a lot of times it's also untrue. So here's the challenge with this recommendation is that there are so many doctors that are so adamant about this idea that a family history of breast cancer eliminates the opportunity to use hormone replacement therapy for women, especially women with osteoporosis is where I see it. So instead of me talking about the studies and talking about why I think that we should really have a better conversation around this topic, what I actually want to do is just talk about the guidelines as they come from the major organizations and societies that are directing doctors to make decisions around the risk benefit of hormones. So I want to walk through what the guidelines say, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the studies that they actually cite to give you an idea of what these studies really showed when it comes specifically to family history and an increased risk of breast cancer or other cancers as it pertains to HRT. Sorry to interrupt this video. But you've heard me talk about health span. You've probably heard me talk about healthy aging. And one of the things that we don't talk about enough are some of the tools that are more in the health span space and not so much in the bone health space. One of those is resveratrol. And I'm bringing it up today because it can really play a role in both bone health and in cellular health and healthy aging. From a bone health perspective, it works like a CIRM, a selective estrogen receptor modifier. It actually can push on estrogen receptors like estrogen, but not quite as strong. It also helps to reduce oxidative stress, and both of those things we know are good for bone health. So that's why I like Four Wells Resveratrol Complex. It's a high-potency antioxidant blend that's designed for everyday wellness. So think of it like this, steady energy, heart support, stronger cellular production, and even healthier-looking skin. So here's what's inside. Resveratrol is obviously the headliner. So this, again, is an antioxidant. It protects your cells and your bones from daily wear and tear. CoQ10 is in here, and that powers up your mitochondria, especially if you happen to be on a statin drug for cholesterol. Your mitochondria are like your cell's batteries, so this really helps your heart, and it helps from an energy perspective with muscles throughout your body. Now, vitamin C and E work together in a tag team mode. So C actually helps recycle E, so your antioxidant defense lasts longer from a vitamin perspective. And then there's quercetin. So quercetin adds another layer of antioxidant coverage. We put all of this together. One serving gives you 1800 milligrams of a thoughtfully stacked blend to support healthy blood flow, cellular production, probably bone health, and everyday vitality. So the reason why I'm currently using this product is that it has real world ingredients that have great research behind them and are complementary, and they're all packed into one product. So supplements are never one size fits all. And that's why you don't see me recommend one product for everybody. But if your interests are bone health, heart health, cellular health, then this is a product with all these different things in it that might appeal to you. And just like every product you ever see me recommend, please know that this is GMP certified, it's made in USA facilities, and it's third party tested for your purity and potency. So if you wanna give your cells, your heart, and even your bones proactive support, Click on the link below and grab Four Wells Resveratrol Complex. Use the code Dr. Doug Four Well. It's the number four well, W E L L, at checkout and you'll save 10%. So let's start with a big picture here. Family history in a first degree relative, meaning someone that you share 50% of your genetic code with, is a risk factor for an increased risk of developing breast cancer, especially if they develop cancer as a younger adult. And this is not the same as you personally having had a history of breast cancer. I hear this confused all the time. So I'm using the guidelines here because when I talk about studies, sometimes I get some feedback from physicians to say, look, I don't have time to read all these studies. I don't have time to dig into this topic in great depth. And I totally understand that. I remember, especially when I was practicing, you know, in the conventional medical model, I had a stack of journals on the side of my desk that was as high as the ceiling. Stuff that I wanted to read and didn't have time because we are all overwhelmed with our clinical work with our patients and hospitals practices do not give us adequate admin time, quote unquote, admin time to both take care of patient messages and also to read. So this is something that you have to do on your own and it gets really challenging. And I think most physicians do, but in areas where they don't have access to or interest in reading the actual studies, they will use guidelines. And we should all know the guidelines anyway for the areas that we are actually treating. I recently reviewed a lot of guidelines in setting up our new programs at LifeMD. So I actually went back and reviewed all of these again because I've made protocols off of them before. And the recommendation around this is not arbitrary. 
And I think a lot of people will just use dogma rather than guidelines when they're making these recommendations and having this decision-making conversation with their patients. So let's talk about the Menopause Society guidelines. It states very plainly, and I'm just going to quote it, a family history of breast cancer is not a contraindication to hormone therapy. That means it is not a reason to not start therapy. It could be part of the conversation around risk, but it is not a contraindication. And that is so frequently the thing that I hear from most people is that was their takeaway from the conversation, right? I don't know if the doctor actually said that or not or what they were really thinking. All I know is what the patients are telling me, what our community members come back and say, I talked to my doctor and because my mom had breast cancer at 80, I'm not a candidate for HRT. And that's absolutely not true. And the menopause society says it right there. The Endocrine Society echoes that point, and they note that family history alone should not preclude individualized hormone therapy decisions. Again, it can be part of the decision making, but the question we have to ask ourselves is what is the increased risk? And I'm going to get into that. And the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, ACOG, specifies in their practice bulletin that while women with a family history should be counseled about risk, hormone therapy remains an option when clinically indicated. Again, Yes, let's talk about risk. Let's have that conversation, but it should be an option. HRT should be an option when clinically indicated. So those are three of who I consider to be the most authoritative bodies in women's health, and they are all aligned on the same message. So what does that mean in practice? It means that your doctor should not be telling you no just because your mom or your sister have breast cancer. Instead, you deserve a conversation about your unique risks and the potential benefits. And from my perspective on this channel, especially for women that have osteoporosis who would so greatly benefit from HRT if they are otherwise a candidate for it. So to understand that risk conversation and how I tell it, let's look a little bit at some of the data. So the Women's Health Initiative, or WHI, as most people call it, they looked specifically at this topic because they had a tremendous amount of data. And you can say what you want about how the Women's Health Initiative was designed and the negatives and all that stuff. But it was a prospective randomized controlled trial, it was large enough to see some of these small risks pop up. Like what does family history do for the risk of developing breast cancer? Because they were looking for a diagnosis of breast cancer in a larger patient population on HRT or not. So while again, I don't love the WHI and I don't love the drugs that they were using, but at least we can gather some data from this. And when you look at this from a family history perspective, they did not identify family history as a factor that amplified a hormone therapy related breast cancer risk. In later follow up analyses, they showed that the relative risk associated with the hormone therapy, which again was from the progestin, not from the estrogen, even though it was conjugated equine estrogen. But that small increased relative risk of diagnosis was essentially the same in women with and without a family history of breast cancer. And again, remember in that study, estrogen was associated with a decreased risk to nearly the same degree as the progestin and combination therapy was associated with an increased risk, although actually neither of them were statistically significant. There's another study that looked at over 500,000 women that also looked at family history, and it concluded that the increased risk observed with certain synthetic progestins, again, like MPA and the WHI, did not differ materially in women with versus without a family history. In other words, having a family member with breast cancer or a history of breast cancer did not add additional risk from the hormone therapy itself. I'll keep going. The French E3N cohort, nearly 80,000 women strong, found the same. Estrogen plus micronized progesterone carried no significant increased risk, and family history did not significantly modify those associations. So when someone says, you have a family history so you can't have hormones, they're actually missing the point. Yes, again, family history does increase your personal risk. And even if you used HRT protocol that did increase risk, those risks are separate. They are not additive. But you don't even have to do that. Because if you use bioidentical topical estradiol or transdermal estradiol, like we generally recommend, and you use oral micronized progesterone, if that's possible for you, there is likely not an increased risk of cancer uh, diagnosis of cancer mortality, specifically when it comes to breast, ovarian, uterine, or any other cancers. In fact, it looks to be protective of several cancers, although that is controversial. So for me, hormone therapy is still the gold standard for treating hot flashes, night sweat, sleep disruption, and improving your bone metabolism, especially if you have osteoporosis or osteopenia. 
It helps maintain bone density. It supports metabolic health. It improves quality of life in ways that no other therapy can. Denying women HRT based on an either an outdated, although it was never really there, or an inaccurate assumption or a bias, in my opinion, is just not good medicine. So the clear takeaway for me is this. As a provider who is helping thousands of people in our community and hundreds of patients in our practice to understand the risk benefit around HRT, I implore you, if your doctor is telling you that this is the reason, please ask again. Because a lot of times I think what happens is somebody might take away that this was the reason when actually it wasn't. Maybe your doctor just used this one thing because it's easy to understand, but there were actually other reasons. And that might be okay because not all women are candidates for HRT. I get that. But if your doctor really said that your family history, whether it be an early breast cancer or later breast cancer or some kind of other cancer, is a contraindication, please get a second opinion. Now, that doesn't actually get into some of the genetic things. So like BRCA, for example, is the more commonly known version of a genetic disorder that will actually increase your risk of cancer. I'm not talking about that here. That's a different conversation because we have to talk about then what to do around BRCA. And I'm really not trained in the recommendations around, you know, do you undergo surgical intervention, double mastectomy? Are you taking body parts out that are at risk of cancer and then using HRT? That's a more complex conversation. But for women who have a family history, which is really common, who are potentially otherwise candidates for HRT, this is an area where a lot of women are told no, when really the answer should be yes, but what other risk factors do you have? So that's it on this one, short and sweet. Please remember that life should be about honoring your health, making memories, and aging with strength and grace.